Welcome back. It's still the breakfast on Plus TV Africa as we focus our attention this time around to security matters. The Chief of Defence Staff, General Leo Irabo, has condemned the increase in cases of military personnel aiding and abetting uh, terrorists and bandits in the country. In a letter sent to all commanders of various operations, Irabo asked them to sensitize their officers to the implication of collaborating with the enemy. Now, recently, Lance Corporal Abdullah Jibrin, an instructor with the Nigerian Army Battalion in Gaydem Yobe State, committed suicide. He took his life after he was arrested for allegedly conniving at Boko Haram insurgents who attacked uh, Yobe communities recently. A Jibrin who disappeared from his duty post was said to have been cited among the Boko Haram terrorists who had earlier attacked Gaydem Town. We're now being joined by security consultant and, of course, um, a former army personnel. Uh, let's make welcome Ambassador Roy Ohidewe. Many thanks for joining us on The Breakfast on PLUS TV Africa. Yeah, good morning. It's always a pleasure. All right, let's just dive into it. Uh, uh, Ambassador Roy, it is actually disheartening when we hear... Uh, reports like this uh, when uh, the military is telling us that um, they have um, you know, decimated Boko Haram and the insurgent. Uh, we hear reports that they are actually, in quote, sleeping with the enemy. What does this really tell you? Ambassador Roy, yeah, go ahead. We can hear you. OK, well, there was a little break in your transmission, but um, I kind of understand that we are looking at the concerns emanating from the Chief arrested the um, last program. Yes. Yes. Okay. Now, you see, um, these things have been spoken about. It, it's not now. These things have been spoken about. It's just because of the blessings of um, social media that you could quickly see the viral video and everybody had the story before the army started to respond. You know, in those days, the, the military was like a cult, you know? And um, it's not possible for you to be a mole. It's, it's like 99% um, impossible. Because in, in your house, a, another personnel can just knock the door and say, where this bagger? And your wife will say, he's inside. And you will just walk into your room. You know, your phone, you can leave your phone. Your phone is ringing. Somebody else will pick the phone and say, hello. Uh, OK, he's not here. I will tell him. You know, so we were actually in each other's space all the time. You know, you're either in a platoon, in a battalion, in a division, in a garrison. You are always within a compact community of your colleagues. And it's not so possible for you to just quickly begin to align. That is even one reason why the coup d'etat in Nigeria was not so, um, so, so rampant. You know, it's easier to just break loose and somebody hears about it and you hear there was an attempted coup because everybody's in, in everybody's space. And that was how some senior army generals started to complain. If you remember, so many of them were retired forcefully because they were complaining. They were complaining about the undue influence of ethnicity, the undue influence of religious preference in the military discipline. You know, so the, the religious preference, the ethnicity began to permeate through the military. And that was the complaint of very senior officers. And they were retired. So many of them were dismissed. They were implicated because we failed to see the truth in what they were saying. And do you know how many lives have been lost? You remember all the times we hear that um, soldiers on patrol were, um, were ambushed on the road. We hear that soldiers going to rescue another unit would be ambushed on the road. We hear uh, suicide bombers penetrating into barracks. How did they get into the bars? How did they get into the mami market to blow up the place? You know, but we didn't understand. And we went ahead to start the de-radicalization process instead of imprisonment and recycle. There is a criminal justice system. Every criminal is supposed to be apprehended,
taken to court, um, he is evidence presented, and he's sentenced either to death or to years imprisonment. If it's years imprisonment, then the things that are supposed to happen there is the de-radicalization. It's the same thing that we all go through as criminals, as citizens of this country. You know, if he's not a citizen of this country, then you call into play the laws guiding him from his country. And you know, we failed to do this. We started to create the radicalization camps, giving them better food than the IDPs. We started to recycle them into the society, giving them financial empowerment. Most of them were allowed to recycle back into the military, the police, and people were saying this. And you know that if you, if you want to know why I'm convinced, there is no statistics to show where each of the the radicalized personnel are today. There's no statistics, and we don't know where they are. So if we don't know where they are, how can we say they are not in our military? Okay. I mean, from um, listening to your thoughts this morning, why has it been very difficult for us to address the issue if we understand it from the beginning, like you have mentioned, the fact that you had several sentiments uh, that would have led, you know, having uh, the military being involved in the security challenge that we're faced with. So how, why is it that we never addressed it? Well, um, <laughs> I believe we all know why. Let me tell you. I mentioned about the compromise on religious belief. I mentioned about the compromise on ethnicity. You see, when those two things started to come into the professional bodies like the DSS, the uh, immigrations, the armed forces, the police, it was death before, it was a death sentence for those agents. Because in, if, you, if you see during um, stellar periods in the barrack, you know, everybody gravitates towards whoever is a Muslim, to go and eat, drink. In fact, you hear him being called a bagger. My friend, go and bring this. In the Christian celebrations, everybody is going to each of every Christian's home. You know, but when this politics came into play, and Nigerian politicians started to favor the use of ethnicity and um, religious um, belief as a yardstick, to, to form cliques and um, groups, then we, 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 we shouldn't have allowed it to get into the military because it, become, it became a yard. All right, I will try and reconnect her with Ambassador. Okay. Who okay. is in that is going to favor us to become a military attache somewhere. So everybody started to dance to the tune of the politicians. So whoever, which political party was in power, what tribe was the person, what religion was the person, began to be the discourse. And that was where people started to penetrate and destroy the professionalism in our agencies. So that's the sad note. All right, um, Roy, a lot has been said concerning, you know, those in government uh, also being um, or having some sort of um, collaboration between uh, this Boko Haram over time. If you remember um, the, the case of the CBN um, deputy governor, um, Obadiah Melafia, when he said um, that, when he claimed that rehabilitated terrorists uh, revealed that a certain northern governor is actually aiding and abetting um, this um, Boko Haram insurgents. But as it is right now, where, how do we move, move forward? The, the chief of defense staff has actually come out to speak to troops, you know, on the way forward on uh, not collaborating. But is that enough? You know, we still have, like you said, some of this um, uh, uh, radicalized, the radicalized people still in the fringes of our society just how do we begin to ensure that um, they don't revert into the military system yet again? Well, you know, the, the, the office of the chief of defense staff, the service chiefs, they are handicapped. They are very, very handicapped. The, the attorney general of the federation, 
the Minister of Justice, they all agree that we know those that sponsor terrorism. They agreed. They, 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 they even mentioned, we, we have it online, you can Google, that the names were sent even from the UAE and all that. Then we know that some governors have been mentioned even by the arrested, apprehended criminals when they confessed. Those same people, they, they migrate from being a governor to a senator. Those same people migrate from senator, they are, they are contesting now for um, uh, president. Same people that are ministers, that are mentioned for favor terrorism. Many of them are now going to be governors also. So why are we recycling people that have questions to answer? Why is it that the agencies, the ICPC, the EFCC, the DSS, why don't they have the liberty to execute the, the punitive measures, the, the investigative pattern in our um, 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 constitution? You know, our constitution has limits to what you can do, what you can own. ICPC has been assigned to do that. But who does that? Now we are hearing that Malami is giving cars. Today, this morning, we heard that it's, it's his friends that are donating cars. We have heard that he's launching a hotel. But when Abakari was doing all of those things, it was phone fair on, on social media. Now we are hearing about millions. So if our um, tracking of terrorists has taken us to the doorsteps of governors, why are they not persecuted? Why is executive um, vote not used? to disalign the immunity clause. Why is it that the ministers, they are allowed to depend as sponsors and those that favor terrorism, and they still hold up? You should leave office and answer. The, the, the defense chief is handicapped. The service chiefs, they are handicapped. The Ministry of Defense, the Minister of Defense himself, he has not been able to take any decisive action on all of the complaints of military veterans. These are the community that brings the old tradition of the military that could also support to fish out the most in the military. They are neglected. Is it intentional? So that they will not be able to speak. So all of these things that is going on is political, is tribal, and its religious sentiment implied. Well, um, you, you seem to have actually put out uh, some of the questions, uh, but we're hoping that you definitely answer them. You have rightly mentioned over and over again the issue of um, the minister, you know, the generals themselves, the ministry being handicapped. Why are they handicapped? Okay, let me tell you something. If you if you go back like two years, if you go and count the number of military generals that have been retired, you will understand that certain people are favored to hold certain positions because they are favored by the current political body language. So if they hold those positions, they answer to the drums being beaten by the musician at the stage. So anybody that allows himself to be given a, a, an office, an apex office in any agency in Nigeria, and you don't participate as a professional, you don't resist influence from political debates, from political postulates, you allow those influence into your professionalism as the head of an agency in Nigeria, put together to stabilize the country and protect the people, then you are compromised. If you cannot take a decision and you allow yourself to remain in office to perpetrate such on, on, on professional activities, then you should resign. Look at the recruitment in the police. Look at the recruitment in the military. Go and look at the recruitment pattern. Why is it that people are the ones that dominate? Why is it not Nigerians that have 
for a patriotic attack that will be allowed to join these agencies? Why is the agency promotion pattern? Why is it on favoriting gun? Why is it deployment pattern? So are you so saying, are, are you saying that, well, I'm trying to understand, you know, are you saying that, that the current government, that the ruling class in Nigeria is responsible for all of this impunity? Is that what you're saying? Uh, well, who is responsible? From our presidency, down to every minister. Their unpatriotic activities is clear for everyone to see. Nobody is afraid to talk because some of us have seen death many times. So when we come out to speak, we don't care about the, the repercussion or whatever because what we are saying is online. You can carry your Google and check. Soldiers have been complaining that they are at the front line beyond three years. Three years, somebody has not seen his family. It's on Google. Go and check. He's begging for pass. Some of them were not given pass. They left the front line back to their family. Coming back, they are dismissed. They are published as a wall. A wall is absent without official leave. So, so, but, that, but how does that translate? Been... I mean, we're trying to understand. How does that translate to the impunity um, that we're seeing? That if you have some persons who have been mentioned as uh, sponsoring, being sponsors of terrorists, or um, some military officials that have been, uh, you know, also been mentioned as collaborating with this terrorist and bandit, however uh, we want to call it, to perpetrate all of this evil. How come they have not been arrested? How come the law has not caught up with them? I mean, you have the police to do all of this. You have relevant agencies and bodies to do all of this. So how does all of this translate to the impunity and the fact that you know the executive arm of government or this current administration, those who are the ruling class currently, are responsible for all of this? Well, like you said, you said I've answered all the questions. <laughs> you can now understand that impunity of office means that you can do what you like, not what the office dictates. Now, if there is a there is a case that need to go to court martial, and that case that need to go to court martial is buying time, is being ignored, then you should know that there is impunity of office. The Abakari case, he was supposed to have answered for all of it until other cases began to pop up. Go and look at military men that were involved in the war domain and case with the police. So what was the outcome of that? You know, the war domain case, war domain is still there, and the military that were said to be involved, what happened to them? There was an army officer that was said to have carried monies belonging to the military. And soldiers eloped with that money. He was in court martial. He started to faint in court martial. How many people were culpable? Who is the one that took money? Are you telling me that there are no other people entangled in that misappropriation? Where are those people? This soldier that was killed today, how did he die? It was said that he took guns from the people that had caught him and were leading him to incarceration and caught himself, not them. You know, so, so many things are proven that there is impunity of office. There are people that were said to have been mentioned to be related to sponsor terrorism. Are they military? Where are they? You know, so many other officers have been investigated. All right. Who are those that are involved with it? Who's responsibility? The Ministry of Justice, what does it do? Is it the Ministry of Justice's responsibility to defend people that we are said to be against the state or to process their judicial and um, punitive measures? All right, so Dr. Ovidian. We start having all of this. We are afraid that we cannot answer properly. All right, Dr. Hidebe, fine. We have established the fact that there is a security breach, you know, in the Nigerian army, Nigerian military now. But going forward now, let's proffer uh, solutions to all of this issue. What do we begin to do? The CDS has written to uh, army commanders and all of that, but is that enough? What more can be done? 
Well, um, what I see here now is that um, we will wait for 2023 as my first advice. Then we should begin to learn how to vote for the right people. That's number one. Number two is this. In the military itself, because of the lives we are losing, I employ the service chiefs, the chief of defense staff, no matter what kind of letter you have written, to actually and appropriately begin to fish out more. Be assured that you are leaving the service. So you are coming out to the civilian enclave. So you need to fish out most because the army, the military is the strongest protection line of any country. So if we don't protect it, if we don't design a, a professional organization that will continue to exist in its capacity, then we are making a very big mistake. Then we also advise finally that every military person that discovers that there is activity, there are activities of moles, should please find appropriate channels, other channels, to begin to speak. You can release that information for retired military personnel that you know that you can trust. And I assure you that the veteran community will not accept it because so many retired personnel their children are in service. So if you have any information as a military personnel, pass it to the veteran community, and we will know what to do to safeguard the military of the country. But um, you said that we need to get to a point where we, we should hold on to 2023. And we're just imagining how long Nigerians can hold on. I mean, if we would even survive 2023, because it's a long time uh, you know, to get to. But let's stay with the, the issue now that you have raised. 2023, vote the right people. And will that make any difference? Because the argument here is that we seem to have uh, weak institutions. And institutions are not just made by themselves. These structures are created, uh, you know, are run by people. So if you have a weak institution and you have strong men, and the election is very critical for every government, so how then do you have a system that you have weak institution and you have strong men provide a credible election in 2023 that should we right the wrong? Don't you think that this is just a myth? Well, it, it, is, it is. But when you call someone a strong man, as we speak, Ghana is weak in every aspect. Every Ghanaian was finding any country to go and find um, his, his daily bread. But there was a strong man that sat on the seat. See, strength attracts strength. By the grace of God and by every Nigerian intent, patriotic intent, we shall put the strong man power. And I assure you that Nigerians that are also strong will begin to hold office in the institutions. That is only, uh, it's a myth. But we pray that the myth begin to come to reality. Mm. Because, I mean, it, it's such a strong one. Probably we might never get there. It's a serious mirage, if you ask me. Um, <laughs> because looking at 2023 now, this is not to say that or wanting to sound like a prophet of doom, but if you have a system where we constantly say that, the reason why we've not had, a, a, had um, um, this person's facing the law, if you say you have uh, military persons who are involved in crime and criminality, abating crime, and you know conniving with terrorists to cause havoc, why haven't they been arrested? That's because you have a weak institution. And these institutions are not being run by people. I mean, they're not run by spirits, but people. And so these persons have constantly weakened the institution. Is it the same institution that we're hoping that in 2023 would deliver a credible election that will get us to a point where we need to get to? So we might probably just go in circle, in circle until we probably find another way out. So that, that circle that we are going through is this. There is, there is a pattern of Nigerian change of government that I've been speaking about. When we want to change government, 
Anybody planning to come in as low as a councillor, a local government chairman, you must understand that your office of um, administration, your office of accountability, your finance office, your office of procurement, those are places that you must put in the people that you have been grooming for such opportunity. You know, you don't need to say this person was relevant during our campaign. No. If that person does not fit into any role, you don't give the person any role because they fit into your campaign. We must look at people that we turn round pegs in round holes. You know, so if you are if you are campaigning to be a governor, please, as we have always said, begin to look for proper accountant generals begin to look for proper persons to put in your procurement begin to look at your approvals your vendor approval process people that will do things to, for you people that will not be asking for kickback people that will not be looking for sentiment is it from our party is it from our religion what tribe is he so if you can begin now as praying for hold office and we see you as a strong man. Begin to plan to plant strong people. Right. Begin to plan to plant people at strategic positions, strategic offices. Not because they are members of your party. Not because they are your tribesmen. Not because they attend the same church or mosque with you. The results that you will get is commensurate to the institution strength that are going to work with you. So if you don't think about that now, you are purely, purely on a jamboree. Mm. All right, uh, we still have um, Dr. Roy Ohide, a security expert uh, with us here in the studios. We'll take a quick break and we'll come back and talk about more emerging security challenges facing the country all in a moment. Stay with us. <laughs> 